Section one of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2017. Gleanings in Buddha Fields Studies of Hand and Soul in the Far East by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter one A Living God. 1. Of whatever dimension, the temples or shrines of poor Shinto are all built in the same archaic style. The typical shrine is a windowless oblong building of unpainted timber, with a very steep overhanging roof. The front is the gable end, and the upper part of the perpetually closed doors is wooden lattice work usually a grating of bars closely set and crossing each other at right angles. In most cases the structure is raised slightly above the ground on wooden pillars, and the queer peaked façade, with its visor-like apertures and the fantastic projections of beamwork above its gable angle, might remind the European traveller of certain old Gothic forms of dormer. There is no artificial colour, the plain wood soon turns, under the action of rain and sun, to a natural grey, varying according to surface exposure from the silvery tone of birch bark to the sombre grey of basalt. So shaped and so tinted, the isolated country Yashiro may seem less like a work of joinery than a feature of the scenery, a rural form related to nature as closely as rocks and trees a something that came into existence only as a manifestation of Ohotsuchi no Kami, the earth god, the primeval divinity of the land. Why certain architectural forms produce in the beholder a feeling of weirdness is a question about which I should like to theorize some day. At present I shall venture only to say that Shinto shrines evoke such a feeling. It grows with familiarity instead of weakening, and a knowledge of popular beliefs is apt to intensify it. We have no English words by which these queer shapes can be sufficiently described, much less any language able to communicate the peculiar impression which they make. Those Shinto terms, which we loosely render by the words temple and shrine, are really untranslatable. I mean that the Japanese ideas attaching to them cannot be conveyed by translation. The so-called august house of the kami is not so much a temple in the classic meaning of the term as it is a haunted room, a spirit chamber, a ghost house, many of the lesser divinities being veritably ghosts, ghosts of great warriors and heroes and rulers and teachers, who lived and loved and died hundreds or thousands of years ago. I fancy that to the Western mind the word ghost house will convey better than such terms as shrine and temple some vague notion of the strange character of the Shinto Miya or Yashiro, containing in its perpetual dusk nothing more substantial than symbols or tokens, the latter probably of paper. Now the emptiness behind the visored front is more suggestive than anything material could possibly be and when you remember that millions of people during thousands of years have worshipped their great dead before such yashiro that a whole race still believes those buildings tenanted by viewless conscious personalities you are apt also to reflect how difficult it would be to prove the faith absurd nay in spite of occidental reluctances in spite of whatever you may think it expedient to say or not to say at a later time about the experience, you may very likely find yourself for a moment forced into the attitude of respect toward possibilities. Mere cold reasoning will not help you far in the opposite direction. The evidence of the senses counts for little. You know there are ever so many realities which can neither be seen, nor heard, nor felt, but which exist as forces, tremendous forces. Then again you cannot mock the conviction of forty millions of people while that conviction thrills all about you like the air. 
while conscious that it is pressing upon your psychical being just as the atmosphere presses upon your physical being as for myself whenever i am alone in the presence of a shinto shrine i have the sensation of being haunted and i cannot help thinking about the possible apperceptions of the haunter and this tempts me to fancy how i should feel if i myself were a god dwelling in some old izumo shrine on the summit of a hill guarded by stone lions and shadowed by a holy grove elfishly small my habitation might be but never too small because i should have neither size nor form i should be only a vibration a motion invisible as of ether or of magnetism though able sometimes to shape me a shadow body in the likeness of my former visible self when i should wish to make apparition as air to the bird as water to the fish so would all substance be permeable to the essence of me i should pass at will through the walls of my dwelling to swim in the long gold bath of a sunbeam to thrill in the heart of a flower to ride on the neck of a dragonfly power above life and power over death would be mine and the power of self-extension and the power of self-multiplication and the power of being in all places at one and the same moment simultaneously in a hundred homes i should hear myself worshipped i should inhale the vapour of a hundred offerings each evening from my place within a hundred household shrines i should see the holy lights lighted for me in lamplets of red clay in lamplets of brass the lights of the kami kindled with purest fire and fed with purest oil but in my yashiro upon the hill i should have greatest honour there be times i should gather the multitude of myself together there should i unify my powers to answer supplication from the dusk of my ghost house i should look for the coming of sandaled feet and watch brown supple fingers weaving to my bars the knotted papers which are records of vows and observe the motion of the lips of my worshippers making prayer harai tamae kiyome tamae we have beaten drums we have lighted fires yet the land thirsts and the rice fails deign out of thy divine pity to give us rain o daimyojin harai tamae kiyome tamae i am dark too dark because i have toiled in the field because the sun hath looked upon me deign thou augustly to make me white very white white like the women of the city o daimyojin harai tamai kiyome tamae for tsukamoto motokichi our son a soldier of twenty-nine that he may conquer and come back quickly to us soon very soon we humbly supplicate o daimyojin sometimes a girl would whisper all her heart to me maiden of eighteen years i am loved by a youth of twenty he is good he is true but poverty is with us and the path of our love is dark aid us with thy great divine pity help us that we may become united o daimyojin then to the bars of my shrine she would hang a thick soft tress of hair her own hair glossy and black as the wing of the crow and bound with a cord of mulberry paper and in the fragrance of that offering the simple fragrance of her peasant youth i the ghost and god should find again the feelings of the years when i was man and lover mothers would bring their children to my threshold and teach them to revere me saying bow down before the great bright god make homage to the daimyojin then i should hear the fresh soft clapping of little hands and remember that i the ghost and god had been a father daily i should hear the plash of pure cool water poured out for me and the tinkle of thrown coin and the pattering of dry rice into my wooden box like a pattering of rain and i should be refreshed by the spirit of the water and strengthened by the spirit of the rice festivals would be held to honour me priests black coiffed and linen vestured would bring me offerings of fruit and fish and seaweed and rice cakes and rice wine 
masking their faces with sheets of white paper so as not to breathe upon my food and the miko their daughters fair girls in crimson hakama and robes of snowy white would come to dance with tinkling of little bells with waving of silken fans that i might be gladdened by the bloom of their youth that i might delight in the charm of their grace and there would be music of many thousand years ago weird music of drums and flutes and songs in a tongue no longer spoken while the miko the darlings of the gods would poise and pose before me whose virgins are these the virgins who stand like flowers before the deity they are the virgins of the august deity the august music the dancing of the virgins the deity will be pleased to hear the deity will rejoice to see before the great bright god the virgins dance the virgins all like flowers newly opened votive gifts of many kinds i should be given painted paper lanterns bearing my sacred name and towels of diverse colours printed with the number of the years of the giver and pictures commemorating the fulfilment of prayers for the healing of sickness the saving of ships the quenching of fire the birth of sons also my karashishi my guardian lions would be honoured i should see my pilgrims tying sandals of straw to their necks and to their paws with prayer to the karashishi sama for strength of foot i should see fine moss like emerald fur growing slowly slowly upon the backs of those lions i should see the sprouting of lichens upon their flanks and upon their shoulders in specklings of dead silver in patches of dead gold i should watch through years of generations the gradual sideward sinking of their pedestals undermined by frost and rain until at last my lions would lose their balance and fall and break their mossy heads off after which the people would give me new lions of another form lions of granite or of bronze with gilded teeth and gilded eyes and tails like a torment of fire between the trunks of the cedars and pines between the jointed columns of the bamboos i should observe season after season the changes of the colour of the valley the falling of the snow of winter and the falling of the snow of cherry flowers the lilac spread of the miyakobana the blazing yellow of the natane the sky blue mirrored in flooded levels levels dotted with the moon-shaped hats of the toiling people who would love me and at last the pure and tender green of the growing rice the muku birds and the uguisu would fill the shadows of my grove with ripplings and purlings of melody the bell insects the crickets and the seven marvellous cicadae of summer would make all the wood of my ghost house thrill to their musical storms betimes i should enter like an ecstasy into the tiny lives of them to quicken the joy of their clamour to magnify the sonority of their song but i never can become a god for this is the nineteenth century and nobody can be really aware of the nature of the sensations of a god unless there be gods in the flesh are there perhaps in very remote districts one or two there used to be living gods anciently any man who did something extraordinarily great or good or wise or brave might be declared god after his death no matter how humble his condition in life also good people who had suffered great cruelty and injustice might be apotheosized and there still survives the popular inclination to pay posthumous honour and to make prayer to the spirits of those who die voluntary deaths under particular circumstances to souls of unhappy lovers for example probably the old customs which made this tendency had their origin in the wish to appease the vexed spirit although to-day the experience of great suffering seems to be thought of as qualifying its possessor for divine conditions of being and there would be no foolishness whatever in such a thought but there were even more remarkable deifications certain persons while still alive 
were honoured by having temples built for their spirits and were treated as gods not indeed as national gods but as lesser divinities tutelar deities perhaps or village gods there was for instance hamaguchi gohe a farmer of the district of arita in the province of kishu who was made a god before he died and i think he deserved it two before telling the story of hamaguchi gohe i must say a few words about certain laws or more correctly speaking customs having all the force of laws by which many village communities were ruled in pre-meiji times these customs were based upon the social experience of ages and though they differed in minor details according to province or district their main signification was everywhere about the same some were ethical some industrial some religious and all matters were regulated by them even individual behavior they preserved peace and they compelled mutual help and mutual kindness sometimes there might be serious fighting between different villages little peasant wars about questions of water supply or boundaries but quarrelling between men of the same community could not be tolerated in an age of vendetta and the whole village would resent any needless disturbance of the internal peace to some degree this state of things still exists in the more old-fashioned provinces the people know how to live without quarrelling not to say fighting anywhere as a general rule japanese fight only to kill and when a sober man goes so far as to strike a blow he virtually rejects communal protection and takes his life into his own hands with every probability of losing it the private conduct of the other sex was regulated by some remarkable obligations entirely outside of written codes a peasant girl before marriage enjoyed far more liberty than was permitted to city girls she might be known to have a lover and unless her parents objected very strongly no blame would be given to her it was regarded as an honest union honest at least as to intention but having once made a choice the girl was held bound by that choice if it were discovered that she met another admirer secretly the people would strip her naked allowing her only a shuro leaf for apron and drive her in mockery through every street and alley of the village during this public disgrace of their daughter the parents of the girl dared not show their faces abroad they were expected to share her shame and they had to remain in their house with all the shutters fastened up afterward the girl was sentenced to banishment for five years but at the end of that period she was considered to have expiated her fault and she could return home with the certainty of being spared further reproaches the obligation of mutual help in time of calamity or danger was the most imperative of all communal obligations in case of fire especially everybody was required to give immediate aid to the best of his or her ability even children were not exempted from this duty in towns and cities of course things were differently ordered but in any little country village the universal duty was very plain and simple and its neglect would have been considered unpardonable a curious fact is that this obligation of mutual help extended to religious matters everybody was expected to invoke the help of the gods for the sick or the unfortunate whenever asked to do so for example the village might be ordered to make a sendo mairi on behalf of someone seriously ill Footnote. To perform a sendo mairi means to make one thousand visits to a temple and to repeat one thousand invocations to the deity. But it is considered necessary only to go from the gate or the torii of the temple court to the place of prayer and back one thousand times, repeating the invocation each time, and the task may be divided among any number of persons. Ten visits by one hundred persons, for instance, being quite as efficacious as a thousand visits by a single person. End footnote. On such occasions the kumicho, 
each kumicho was responsible for the conduct of five or more families would run from house to house crying such and such a one is very sick kindly hasten all to make a sendo mairi thereupon however occupied at the moment every soul in the settlement was expected to hurry to the temple taking care not to trip or stumble on the way as a single misstep during the performance of a sendo mairi was believed to mean misfortune for the sick three now concerning hamaguchi from immemorial time the shores of japan have been swept at irregular intervals of centuries by enormous tidal waves tidal waves caused by earthquakes or by submarine volcanic action these awful sudden risings of the sea are called by the japanese tsunami the last one occurred on the evening of june seventeenth eighteen ninety six when a wave nearly two hundred miles long struck the northeastern provinces of miyagi iwate and aomori wrecking scores of towns and villages ruining whole districts and destroying nearly thirty thousand human lives the story of hamaguchi gohei is the story of a like calamity which happened long before the era of meiji on another part of the japanese coast he was an old man at the time of the occurrence that made him famous he was the most influential resident of the village to which he belonged he had been for many years its mura osa or headman and he was not less liked than respected the people usually called him oji san which means grandfather but being the richest member of the community he was sometimes officially referred to as the choja he used to advise the smaller farmers about their interests to arbitrate their disputes to advance them money at need and to dispose of their rice for them on the best terms possible hamaguchi's big thatched farmhouse stood at the verge of a small plateau overlooking a bay the plateau mostly devoted to rice culture was hemmed in on three sides by thickly wooded summits from its outer verge the land sloped down in a huge green concavity as if scooped out to the edge of the water and the whole of this slope some three-quarters of a mile long was so terraced as to look when viewed from the open sea like an enormous flight of green steps divided in the centre by a narrow white zigzag a streak of mountain road ninety thatched dwellings and a shinto temple composing the village proper stood along the curve of the bay and other houses climbed straggling up the slope for some distance on either side of the narrow road leading to the choja's home one autumn evening hamaguchi gohei was looking down from the balcony of his house at some preparations for merry-making in the village below there had been a very fine rice crop and the peasants were going to celebrate their harvest by a dance in the court of the ujigami the shinto parish temple the old man could see the festival banners nobori fluttering above the roofs of the solitary street the strings of paper lanterns festooned between bamboo poles the decorations of the shrine and the brightly coloured gathering of the young people he had nobody with him that evening but his little grandson a lad of ten the rest of the household having gone early to the village he would have accompanied them had he not been feeling less strong than usual the day had been oppressive and in spite of a rising breeze there was still in the air that sort of heavy heat which according to the experience of the japanese peasant at certain seasons precedes an earthquake and presently an earthquake came it was not strong enough to frighten anybody but hamaguchi who had felt hundreds of shocks in his time thought it was queer a long slow spongy motion probably it was but the after tremor of some immense seismic action very far away the house crackled and rocked gently several times then all became still again as the quaking ceased hamaguchi's keen old eyes were anxiously turned toward the village it often happens that the attention of a person gazed fixedly at a particular spot or object 
is suddenly diverted by the sense of something not knowingly seen at all by a mere vague feeling of the unfamiliar in that dim outer circle of unconscious perception which lies beyond the field of clear vision thus it chanced that hamaguchi became aware of something unusual in the offing he rose to his feet and looked at the sea it had darkened quite suddenly and it was acting strangely it seemed to be moving against the wind it was running away from the land within a very little time the whole village had noticed the phenomenon apparently no one had felt the previous motion of the ground but all were evidently astounded by the movement of the water they were running to the beach and even beyond the beach to watch it no such ebb had been witnessed on that coast within the memory of living man things never seen before were making apparition unfamiliar spaces of ribbed sand and reaches of weed hung rock were left bare even as hamaguchi gazed and none of the people below appeared to guess what that monstrous ebb signified hamaguchi gohei himself had never seen such a thing before but he remembered things told him in his childhood by his father's father and he knew all the transitions of the coast he understood what the sea was going to do perhaps he thought of the time needed to send a message to the village or to get the priests of the buddhist temple on the hill to sound their big bell but it would take very much longer to tell what he might have thought than it took him to think he simply called to his grandson tada quick very quick light me a torch taimatsu or pine torches are kept in many coast dwellings for use on stormy nights and also for use at certain shinto festivals the child kindled a torch at once and the old man hurried with it to the fields where hundreds of rice stacks representing most of his invested capital stood awaiting transportation approaching those nearest the verge of the slope he began to apply the torch to them hurrying from one to another as quickly as his aged limbs could carry him the sun-dried stalks caught like tinder the strengthening sea breeze blew the blaze landward and presently rank behind rank the stacks burst into flame sending skyward columns of smoke that met and mingled into one enormous cloudy whirl tada astonished and terrified ran after his grandfather crying oji san why oji san why why but hamaguchi did not answer he had no time to explain he was thinking only of the four hundred lives in peril for a while the child stared wildly at the blazing rice then burst into tears and ran back to the house feeling sure that his grandfather had gone mad hamaguchi went on firing stack after stack till he had reached the limit of his field then he threw down his torch and waited the acolyte of the hill temple observing the blaze set the big bell booming and the people responded to the double appeal hamaguchi watched them hurrying in from the sands and over the beach and up from the village like a swarming of ants and to his anxious eyes scarcely faster for the moments seemed terribly long to him the sun was going down the wrinkled bed of the bay and a vast sallow speckled expanse beyond it lay naked to the last orange glow and still the sea was fleeing toward the horizon really however hamaguchi did not have very long to wait before the first party of succor arrived a score of agile young peasants who wanted to attack the fire at once but the choja holding out both arms stopped them let it burn lads he commanded let it be i want the whole mura here there is a great danger taihenda the whole village was coming and hamaguchi counted all the young men and boys were soon on the spot and not a few of the more active women and girls then came most of the older folk and mothers with babies at their backs and even children for children could help to pass water and the elders too feeble to keep up with the first rush could be seen well on their way up the steep ascent 
the growing multitude still knowing nothing looked alternately in sorrowful wonder at the flaming fields and at the impassive face of their choja and the sun went down grandfather is mad i am afraid of him sobbed tada in answer to a number of questions he is mad he set fire to the rice on purpose i saw him do it as for the rice cried hamaguchi the child tells the truth i set fire to the rice are all the people here the kumicho and the heads of families looked about them and down the hill and made reply all are here or very soon will be we cannot understand this thing kita shouted the old man at the top of his voice pointing to the open say now if i be mad through the twilight eastward all looked and saw at the edge of the dusky horizon a long lean dim line like the shadowing of a coast where no coast ever was a line that thickened as they gazed that broadened as a coastline broadens to the eyes of one approaching it yet incomparably more quickly for that long darkness was the returning sea towering like a cliff and coursing more swiftly than the kite flies tsunami shrieked the people and then all the shrieks and all sounds and all power to hear sounds were annihilated by a nameless shock heavier than any thunder as the colossal swell smote the shore with a weight that set a shudder through the hills and with a foam burst like a blaze of sheet lightning then for an instant nothing was visible but a storm of spray rushing up the slope like a cloud and the people scattered back in panic from the mere menace of it when they looked again they saw a white horror of sea raving over the place of their homes it drew back roaring and tearing out the bowels of the land as it went twice thrice five times the sea struck and ebbed but each time with lesser surges then it returned to its ancient bed and stayed still raging as after a typhoon on the plateau for a time there was no word spoken all stared speechlessly at the desolation beneath the ghastliness of hurled rock and naked riven cliff the bewilderment of scooped up deep sea rack and single shot over the empty site of dwelling and temple the village was not the greater part of the fields were not even the terraces had ceased to exist and of all the homes that had been about the bay there remained nothing recognizable except two straw roofs tossing madly in the offing the after terror of the death escaped and the stupefaction of the general loss kept all limbs dumb until the voice of hamaguchi was heard again observing gently that was why i set fire to the rice he their choja now stood among them almost as poor as the poorest for his wealth was gone but he had saved four hundred lives by the sacrifice little tada ran to him and caught his hand and asked forgiveness for having said naughty things whereupon the people woke up to the knowledge of why they were alive and began to wonder at the simple unselfish foresight that had saved them and the headmen prostrated themselves in the dust before hamaguchi gohei and the people after them then the old man wept a little partly because he was happy and partly because he was aged and weak and had been sorely tired my house remains he said as soon as he could find words automatically caressing tada's brown cheeks and there is room for many also the temple on the hill stands and there is shelter there for the others then he led the way to his house and the people cried and shouted the period of distress was long because in those days there were no means of quick communication between district and district and the help needed had to be sent from far away but when better times came the people did not forget their debt to hamaguchi gohei they could not make him rich nor would he have suffered them to do so even had it been possible moreover 
gifts could never have sufficed as an expression of their reverential feeling towards him for they believed that the ghost within him was divine so they declared him a god and thereafter called him hamaguchi daimyojin thinking they could give him no greater honour and truly no greater honour in any country could be given to mortal man and when they rebuilt the village they built a temple to the spirit of him and fixed above the front of it a tablet bearing his name in chinese text of gold and they worshipped him there with prayer and with offerings how he felt about it i cannot say i know only that he continued to live in his old thatched home upon the hill with his children and his children's children just as humanely and simply as before while his soul was being worshipped in the shrine below a hundred years and more he has been dead but his temple they tell me still stands and the people still pray to the ghost of the good old farmer to help them in time of fear or trouble i asked a japanese philosopher and friend to explain to me how the peasants could rationally imagine the spirit of hamaguchi in one place while his living body was in another also i inquired whether it was only one of his souls which they had worshipped during his life and whether they imagined that particular soul to have detached itself from the rest to receive homage the peasants my friend answered think of the mind or spirit of a person as something which even during life can be in many places at the same instant such an idea is of course quite different from western ideas about the soul any more rational i mischievously asked well he responded with a buddhist smile if we accept the doctrine of the unity of all mind the idea of the japanese peasant would appear to contain at least some adumbration of truth i could not say so much for your western notions about the soul End of section one Section 2 of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 2 Out of the Street. Part 1. These, said Manyuman, putting on the table a roll of wonderfully written Japanese manuscript, are vulgar songs. If they are to be spoken of in some honorable book, perhaps it will be good to say that they are vulgar, so that Western people may not be deceived. Next to my house there is a vacant lot where washermen, Sintakuya, work in the ancient manner, singing as they work, and whipping the wet garments upon big flat stones. Every morning at daybreak, their singing wakens me, and I like to listen to it, though I cannot often catch the words. It is full of long, queer, plaintive modulations. Yesterday, the apprentice, a lad of fifteen, and the master of the washerman were singing alternately, as if answering each other. The contrast between the tones of the man, sonorous as if boomed through a conch, and the clarion alto of the boy being very pleasant to hear, whereupon i called manyaman and asked him what the singing was about the song of the boy he said is an old song things never changed since the time of the gods the flowing of water the way of love i heard it often when i was myself a boy and the other song the other song is probably new three years thought of her five years sought for her only for one night held her in my arms a very foolish song i don't know i said there are famous western romances containing nothing wiser and what is the rest of the song there is no more that is the whole of the song if it be honorably desired i can write down the songs of the washermen and the songs which are sung in the street by the smiths and the carpenters and the bamboo weavers and the rice cleaners but they are all nearly the same 
thus came it to pass that monumon made for me a collection of vulgar songs by vulgar monumon meant written in the speech of the common people he is himself an adept at classical verse and despises the hayari uta or ditties of the day it requires something very delicate to please him and what pleases him i am not qualified to write about for one must be a very good japanese scholar to meddle with the superior varieties of japanese poetry if you care to know how difficult the subject is just study the chapter on prosody in aston's grammar of the japanese written language or the introduction to professor chamberlain's classical poetry of the japanese her poetry is the one original art which japan has certainly not borrowed either from china or from any other country and its most refined charm is the essence irreproducible of the very flower of the language itself hence the difficulty of representing even partially in any western tongue its subtler delicacies of sentiment allusion and color but to understand the compositions of the people no scholarship is needed they are characterized by the greatest possible simplicity directness and sincerity the real art of them in short is their absolute artlessness that was why i wanted them springing straight from the heart of the eternal youth of the race these little gushes of song like the untaught poetry of every people utter what belongs to all human experience rather than to the limited life of a class or a time and even in their melodies still resound the fresh and powerful pulsings of their primal source monument had written down forty-seven songs and with his help i made free renderings of the best they were very brief varying from seventeen to thirty-one syllables in length nearly all japanese poetical meter consists of simple alterations of lines of five and seven syllables the frequent exceptions which popular songs offer to this rule being merely irregularities such as the singer can smooth over either by slurring or by prolonging certain vowel sounds most of the songs which monument had collected were of twenty-six syllables only being composed of three successive lines of seven syllables each followed by one of five thus kamyo konokata kawaranu monawa mitsu no nagaroto koi no michi among various deviations from this construction i found seven 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 five and five seven 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 five and seven five seven five and five seven five but the classical five line form tanka represented by five seven five seven seven was entirely absent terms indicating gender were likewise absent even the expressions corresponding to i and you were seldom used and the words signifying beloved applying equally to either sex only by the conventional value of some comparison the use of a particular emotional tone or the mention of some detail of costume was the sex of the speaker suggested as in this verse i am the water weed drifting finding no place of attachment where i wonder and when shall my flower begin to bloom evidently the speaker is a girl who wishes for a lover the same simple utterance by masculine lips would sound in japanese ears much as would sound in english ears a man's comparison of himself to a violet or to a rose for the like reason one knows that in the following song the speaker is not a woman flowers in both my hands flowers of plum and cherry which will be i wonder the flower to give me fruit womanly charm is compared to the cherry flower and also to the plum flower but the quality symbolized by the plum flower is moral always rather than physical the verse represents a man strongly attracted by two girls one perhaps a dancer very fair to look upon the other beautiful in character which shall he choose to be his companion for life one more example too long with pen in hand idling fearing and doubting i cast my silver pen for the test of the tatamizan here we know from the mention of the hairpin that the speaker is a woman and we can also suppose that she is a geisha the sort of divination called tatamizan being especially popular with dancing girls the rush covering the floor mats tatami woven over a frame of thin strings shows on its upper surface a regular series of lines about three-fourths of an inch apart 
the girl throws her pin upon a mat and then counts the lines it touches according to their number she deems herself lucky or unlucky sometimes a little pipe geisha's pipes are usually of silver is used instead of the hairpin the theme of all these songs was love as indeed it is of the vast majority of the japanese chansons de rues et des bois even songs about celebrated places usually containing some amatory suggestion i notice that almost every simple phase of the emotion from its earliest budding to its uttermost ripening was represented in the collection and i therefore tried to arrange the pieces according to the natural passional sequence the result had some dramatic suggestiveness part two the songs really form three distinct groups each corresponding to a particular period of that emotional experience which is the subject of all in the first group of seven the surprise and pain and weakness of passion find utterance beginning with a plaintive cry of reproach and closing with a whisper of trust one you by all others disliked oh why must my heart thus like you two this pain which i cannot speak of to any one in the world tell me who has made it whose do you think the fault three will it be night forever i lose my way in the darkness who goes by the path of love must always go astray four even the brightest lamp even the light electric cannot lighten at all the dusk of the way of love five always the more i love the more it is hard to say so oh how happy i were should the loved one say it first six such a little word only to say i love you why oh why do i find it hard to say like this seven clicked to the locks of our hearts let the keys remain in our bosoms after which mutual confidence the illusion naturally deepens suffering yields to a joy that cannot disguise itself and the keys of the heart are thrown away this is the second stage one the person who said before i hate my life since i saw you now after union prays to live for a thousand years two you and i together lilies that grow in a valley this is our blossoming time but nobody knows the fact three receiving from his hand the cup of the wine of greeting even before i drink i feel that my face grows red four i cannot hide in my heart the happy knowledge that fills it asking each not to tell i spread the news all round five all crows alike are black everywhere under heaven the person that others like why should not i like too six going to see the beloved a thousand re are as one re returning without having seen one re is a thousand re footnote one re is equal to about two and a half english miles end of note seven going to see the beloved even the water of rice fields ever becomes as i drink nectar of gods to the taste eight you till a hundred years i until nine and ninety together we still shall be in the time when the hair turns white nine seeing the face at once the folly i wanted to utter all melts out of my thought and somehow the tears come first ten crying for joy made wet my sleeve that dries too quickly tis not the same with the heart that cannot dry so soon eleven to heaven with all my soul i prayed to prevent your going already to keep you with me answers the blessed rain so passes the period of illusion the rest is doubt and pain only the love remains to challenge even death one parted from you my beloved i go alone to the pine field there is dew of night on the leaves there is also dew of tears two even to see the birds flying freely above me only deepens my sorrow makes me thoughtful the more three coming or coming not far down the river gazing 
only yamogi shadows astir in the bed of the stream four letters come by the post photographs give me the shadow only one thing remains which i cannot hope to gain five if i may not see the face but only look at the letter then it were better far only in dreams to see six though his body were broken to pieces though his bones on the shore were bleaching i would find my way to rejoin him after gathering up the bones part three thus was it that these little songs composed in different generations and in different parts of japan by various persons seemed to shape themselves for me into the ghost of a romance into the shadow of a story needing no name of time or place or person because eternally the same in all times and places monyamon asked which of the songs i liked best and i turned over his manuscript again to see if i can make a choice without in the bright spring air the washers are working and i hear the heavy pomp pom of the beating of wet robes regular as the beating of a heart suddenly as i muse the voice of the boy soars up in one long clear shrill splendid rocket tone and breaks and softly trembles down in coruscations of fractional notes singing the song that monyamon remembers hearing when he himself was a boy things never changed since the time of the gods the flowing of water the way of love i think that is the best i said it is the soul of all the rest in no nusibito koi no uta interpretively murmurs manyamon even as out of poverty comes the thief so out of love the song end of section two Section 3 of Gleanings in Buddha Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2018. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 3 Notes of a Trip to Kyoto. Part 1. One. it had been intended to celebrate in spring the eleven hundredth anniversary of the foundation of kyoto but the outbreak of pestilence caused postponement of the festival to the autumn and the celebration began on the fifteenth of the tenth month little festival medals of nickel made to be pinned to the breast like military decorations were for sale at half a yen each these medals entitled the wearers to special cheap fares on all the japanese railroad and steamship lines and to other desirable privileges such as free entrance to wonderful palaces gardens and temples on the twenty third of october i found myself in possession of a medal and journeying to kyoto by the first morning train which was overcrowded with people eager to witness the great historical processions announced for the twenty-fourth and twenty-fifth many had to travel standing but the crowd was good-natured and merry a number of my fellow passengers were osaka geisha going to the festival they diverted themselves by singing songs and by playing ken with some male acquaintances and their kittenish pranks and funny cries kept everybody amused one had an extraordinary voice with which she could twitter like a sparrow you can always tell by the voices of women conversing anywhere in a hotel for example if there happen to be any geisha among them because the peculiar timbre given by professional training is immediately recognizable the wonderful character of that training however is fairly manifested only when the really professional tones of the voice are used falsetto tones never touching but often curiously sweet now the street singers the poor blind women who sing ballads with the natural voice only use tones that draw tears the voice is generally a powerful contralto and the deep tones are the tones that touch the falsetto tones of the geisha rise into a treble above the natural range of the adult voice and as penetrating as a bird's 
in a banquet hall full of guests you can distinctly hear above all the sound of drums and shamisen and chatter and laughter the thin sweet cry of the geisha playing ken futatsu 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 while you may be quite unable to hear the shouted response of the man she plays with mitsu 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 two the first surprise with which kyoto greeted her visitors was the beauty of her festival decorations every street had been prepared for illumination before each house had been planted a new lantern post of unpainted wood from which a lantern bearing some appropriate design was suspended there were also national flags and sprigs of pine above each entrance but the lanterns made the charm of the display in each section of street they were of the same form and were fixed at exactly the same height and were protected from possible bad weather by the same kind of covering but in different streets the lanterns were different in some of the wide thoroughfares they were very large and while in some streets each was sheltered by a little wooden awning in others every lantern had a japanese paper umbrella spread and fastened above it there was no pageant on the morning of my arrival and i spent a couple of hours delightfully at the festival exhibition of kakemono in the imperial summer palace called omuro gosho unlike the professional art display which i had seen in the spring this represented chiefly the work of students and i found it incomparably more original and attractive nearly all the pictures thousands in number were for sale at prices ranging from three to fifty yen and it was impossible not to buy to the limit of one's purse there were studies of nature evidently made on the spot such as a glimpse of hazy autumn rice fields with dragonflies darting over the drooping grain maples crimsoning above a tremendous gorge ranges of peaks steeped in morning mist and a peasant's cottage perched on the verge of some dizzy mountain road also there were fine bits of realism such as a cat seizing a mouse in the act of stealing the offerings placed in a buddhist household shrine but i have no intention to try the reader's patience with a description of pictures i mention my visit to the display only because of something i saw there more interesting than any picture near the main entrance was a specimen of handwriting intended to be mounted as a kakemono later on and temporarily fixed upon a board about three feet long by eighteen inches wide a japanese poem it was a wonder of calligraphy instead of the usual red stamp or seal with which the japanese calligrapher marks his masterpieces i saw the red imprint of a tiny tiny hand a living hand which had been smeared with crimson printing ink and deftly pressed upon the paper i could distinguish those little finger marks of which mr galton has taught us the characteristic importance that writing had been done in the presence of his imperial majesty by a child of six years or of five according to our western method of computing age from the date of birth the prime minister maki ito saw the miracle and adopted the little boy whose present name is therefore ito metsui even japanese observers could scarcely believe the testimony of their own eyes few adult calligraphers could surpass that writing certainly no occidental artist even after years of study could repeat the feat performed by the brush of that child before the emperor of course such a child can be born but once in a thousand years to realize or almost realize the ancient chinese legends of divinely inspired writers still it was not the beauty of the thing in itself which impressed me but the weird extraordinary indubitable proof it afforded of an inherited memory so vivid as to be almost equal to the recollection of former births generations of dead calligraphers revived in the fingers of that tiny hand the thing was never the work of an individual child five years old but beyond all question the work of ghosts the countless ghosts that make the compound ancestral soul 
it was proof visible and tangible of psychological and physiological wonders justifying both the shinto doctrine of ancestor worship and the buddhist doctrine of pre-existence three after looking at all the pictures i visited the great palace garden only recently opened to the public it is called the garden of the cavern of the genii at least genii is about the only word one can use to translate the term senin for which there is no real english equivalent the senin who are supposed to possess immortal life and to haunt forests or caverns being Japanese, or rather Chinese mythological transformations of the Indian Rishi. The garden deserves its name. I felt as if I had indeed entered an enchanted place. It is a landscape garden, a Buddhist creation, belonging to what is now simply a palace, but was once a monastery, built as a religious retreat for emperors and princes weary of earthly vanities. The first impression received after passing the gate is that of a grand old English park, the colossal trees, the shorn grass, the broad walks, the fresh sweet scent of verdure, all awaken English memories. But as you proceed farther, these memories are slowly effaced, and a true oriental impression defines. You perceive that the forms of those mighty trees are not European, various and surprising exotic details reveal themselves and then you are gazing upon a sheet of water containing high rocks and islets connected by bridges of the strangest shapes gradually only gradually the immense charm the weird buddhist charm of the place grows and grows upon you and the sense of its vast antiquity defines to touch that chord of the aesthetic feeling which brings the vibration of awe. Considered as a human work alone, the garden is a marvel. Only the skilled labor of thousands could have joined together the mere bones of it, the prodigious rocky skeleton of its plan. This one shaped and earthed and planted, nature was left alone to finish the wonder. Working through ten centuries, she has surpassed, nay, unspeakably magnified, the dream of the artist. Without exact information, no stranger unfamiliar with the laws and the purpose of Japanese garden construction could imagine that all this had a human designer some thousand years ago. The effect is that of a section of primeval forest, preserved untouched from the beginning, and walled away from the rest of the world in the heart of the old capital. The rock faces, the great fantastic roots, the shadowed bypaths, the few ancient graven monoliths, are all cushioned with the moss of ages, and climbing things have developed stems a foot thick that hang across spaces like monstrous serpents. Parts of the garden vividly recall some aspects of tropical nature in the Antilles, though one misses the palms the bewildering web and woof of lianas the reptiles and the sinister day silence of a west indian forest the joyous storm of bird life overhead is an astonishment and proclaims gratefully to the visitor that the wild creatures of this monastic paradise have never been harmed or frightened by man as i arrived at last with regret at the gate of exit I could not help feeling envious of its keeper, only to be a servant in such a garden were a privilege well worth praying for. 4. Feeling hungry, I told my runner to take me to a restaurant, because the hotel was very far, and the kuruma bore me into an obscure street and halted before a rickety-looking house with some misspelled English painted above the entrance. I remember only the word foreign. After taking off my shoes, I climbed three flights of breakneck stairs, or rather ladders, to find in the third story a set of rooms furnished in foreign style. The windows were glass, the linen was satisfactory, the only things Japanese were the mattings and a welcome smoking box. American chromo lithographs decorated the walls. Nevertheless, I suspected that few foreigners had ever been in the house, 
it existed by sending out western cooking in little tin boxes to native hotels and the rooms had doubtless been fitted up for japanese visitors i noticed that the plates cups and other utensils bore the monogram of a long defunct english hotel which used to exist in one of the open ports the dinner was served by nice-looking girls who had certainly been trained by somebody accustomed to foreign service but their innocent curiosity and extreme shyness convinced me that they had never waited upon a real foreigner before suddenly i observed on a table at the other end of the room something resembling a music box and covered with a piece of crochet work i went to it and discovered the wreck of a hero phone there were plenty of perforated musical selections i fixed the crank in place and tried to extort the music of a german song entitled five hundred thousand devils the hero phone gurgled moaned roared for a moment sobbed roared again and relapsed into silence i tried a number of other selections including les cloches de cornville but the noises produced were in all cases about the same evidently the thing had been bought together with the monogram bearing delft and britannia ware at some auction sale in one of the foreign settlements there was a queer melancholy in the experience difficult to express one must have lived in japan to understand why the thing appeared so exiled so pathetically out of place so utterly misunderstood our harmonized western music means simply so much noise to the average japanese ear and i feel quite sure that the internal condition of the herophone remained unknown to its oriental proprietor an equally singular but more pleasant experience awaited me on the road back to the hotel i halted at a second-hand furniture shop to look at some curiosities and perceived among a lot of old books a big volume bearing in letters of much tarnished gold the title atlantic monthly looking closer i saw volume five boston tickner and fields eighteen sixty volumes of the atlantic of eighteen sixty are not common anywhere i asked the price and the japanese shopkeeper said fifty sen because it was a very large book i was much too pleased to think of bargaining with him and secured the prize i looked through its stained pages for old friends and found them all anonymous in eighteen sixty five many world famous in eighteen ninety five there were installments of elsie venner under the title of the professor's stories chapters of roba di roma a poem called pythagoras but since renamed metempsychosis as lovers of thomas bailey aldrich are doubtless aware the personal narrative of a filibuster with walker in nicaragua admirable papers upon the maroons of jamaica and the maroons of surinam and upon other precious things an essay on japan opening with the significant sentence the arrival in this country of an embassy from japan the first political delegation ever vouchsafed to a foreign nation by that reticent and jealous people is now a topic of universal interest a little farther on some popular misapprehensions of the period were thus corrected although now known to be entirely distinct the chinese and japanese were for a long time looked upon as kindred races and esteemed alike we find that while on close examination the imagined attractions of china disappear those of japan become more definite any japanese of this self-assertive twenty-eighth year of meiji could scarcely find fault with the atlantic's estimate of his country thirty-five years ago its commanding position its wealth its commercial resources and the quick intelligence of its people not at all inferior to that of the people of the west although naturally restricted in its development give to japan an importance far above that of any other eastern country the only error of this generous estimate was an error centuries old 
the delusion of Japan's wealth. What made me feel a little ancient was to recognize in the quaint spellings Siogun, Tycoon, Sintu, Kyuzyu, Fideyoshi, Nobanunga, spellings of the old Dutch and old Jesuit writers, the modern and familiar Shogun, Tycoon, Shinto, Kyushu, Hideyoshi, and Nobunaga. I passed the evening wandering through the illuminated streets and visited some of the numberless shows. I saw a young man writing Buddhist texts and drawing horses with his feet, the extraordinary fact about the work being that the texts were written backwards, from the bottom of the column up, just as an ordinary calligrapher would write them from the top of the column down, and the pictures of horses were always commenced with the tail. I saw a kind of amphitheatre with an aquarium in lieu of arena, where mermaids swam and sang Japanese songs. I saw maidens made by glamour out of flowers, by a Japanese cultivator of chrysanthemums. And between whiles I peeped into the toy shops full of novelties. What there especially struck me was the display of that astounding ingenuity by which Japanese inventors are able to reach, at a cost too small to name, precisely the same results as those exhibited in our expensive mechanical toys. A group of cocks and hens made of paper were set to pecking imaginary grain out of a basket by the pressure of a bamboo spring, the whole thing costing half a cent. An artificial mouse ran about, doubling and scurrying, as if trying to slip under mats or into chinks. It cost only one cent and was made with a bit of coloured paper, a spool of baked clay and a long thread. You had only to pull the thread and the mouse began to run. Butterflies of paper, moved by an equally simple device, began to fly when thrown into the air. An artificial cuttlefish began to wriggle all its tentacles when you blew into a little rush tube fixed under its head. When I decided to return, the lanterns were out, the shops were closing, and the streets darkened about me long before I reached the hotel. After the great glow of the illumination, the witchcrafts of the shows, the merry tumult, the sea-like sound of wooden sandals, this sudden coming of blankness and silence made me feel as if the previous experience had been unreal, an illusion of light and colour and noise made just to deceive, as in stories of goblin foxes. But the quick vanishing of all that composes a Japanese festival night really lends a keener edge to the pleasure of remembrance. There is no slow fading out of the phantasmagoria, and its memory is thus kept free from the least tinge of melancholy. End of section 3、section four of Gleanings in Buddha Fields This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2018. Gleanings in Buddha Fields by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 3 Notes of a Trip to Kyoto. Part 2. 5. While I was thinking about the fugitive charm of Japanese amusements, the question put itself Are not all pleasures keen in proportion to their evanescence? Proof of the affirmative would lend strong support to the Buddhist theory of the nature of pleasure. We know that mental enjoyments are powerful in proportion to the complexity of the feelings and ideas composing them. And the most complex feelings would therefore seem to be of necessity the briefest. At all events, Japanese popular pleasures have the double peculiarity of being evanescent and complex, not merely because of their delicacy and their multiplicity of detail, but because this delicacy and multiplicity are adventitious, depending upon temporary conditions and combinations. Among such conditions are the seasons of flowering and of fading, hours of sunshine or full moon, 
a change of place, a shifting of light and shade. Among combinations are the fugitive holiday manifestations of the race genius, fragilities utilized to create illusion, dreams made visible, memories revived in symbols, images, ideographs, dashes of color, fragments of melody, countless minute appeals both to individual experience and to national sentiment. And the emotional result remains incommunicable to Western minds, because the myriad little details and suggestions producing it belong to a world incomprehensible without years of familiarity, a world of traditions, beliefs, superstitions, feelings, ideas, about which foreigners, as a general rule, know nothing. Even by the few who do know that world, the nameless delicious sensation, the great vague wave of pleasure excited by the spectacle of Japanese enjoyment, can only be described as the feeling of Japan. A sociological fact of interest is suggested by the amazing cheapness of these pleasures. The charm of Japanese life presents us with the extraordinary phenomenon of poverty as an influence in the development of aesthetic sentiment, or at least as a factor in deciding the direction and expansion of that development. But for poverty, the race could not have discovered, ages ago, the secret of making pleasure the commonest instead of the costliest of experiences, the divine art of creating the beautiful out of nothing. One explanation of this cheapness is the capacity of the people to find in everything natural, in landscapes, mists, clouds, sunsets, in the sight of birds, insects and flowers, a much keener pleasure than we, as the vividness of their artistic presentations of visual experience bears witness. Another explanation is that the national religions and the old-fashioned education have so developed imaginative power that it can be stirred into an activity of delight by anything, however trifling, able to suggest the traditions or the legends of the past. Perhaps Japanese cheap pleasures might be broadly divided into those of time and place, furnished by nature with the help of man, and those of time and place invented by man at the suggestion of nature. The former class can be found in every province, and yearly multiply. Some locality is chosen on hill or coast, by lake or river. Gardens are made, trees planted, resting houses built to command the finest points of view, and the wild site is presently transformed into a place of pilgrimage for pleasure seekers. One spot is famed for cherry trees, another for maples, another for wisteria, and each of the seasons, even snowy winter, helps to make the particular beauty of some resort. The sites of the most celebrated temples, or at least of the greater number of them, were thus selected, always where the beauty of nature could inspire and aid the work of the religious architect, and where it still has power to make many a one wish that he could become a Buddhist or Shinto priest. Religion, indeed, is everywhere in Japan associated with famous scenery, with landscapes, cascades, peaks, rocks, islands, with the best places from which to view the blossoming of flowers, the reflection of the autumn moon on water, or the sparkling of fireflies on summer nights. Decorations, illuminations, street displays of every sort, but especially those of holy days, compose a large part of the pleasures of city life which all can share. The appeals thus made to aesthetic fancy at festivals represent the labor, perhaps, of tens of thousands of hands and brains, but each individual contributor to the public effort works according to his particular thought and taste, even while obeying old rules, so that the total ultimate result is a wondrous, a bewildering, an incalculable variety. Anybody can contribute to such an occasion, and everybody does, for the cheapest material is used. 
paper straw or stone makes no real difference the art sense is superbly independent of the material what shapes that material is perfect comprehension of something natural something real whether a blossom made of chicken feathers a clay turtle or duck or sparrow a pasteboard cricket or mantis or frog the idea is fully conceived and exactly realized spiders of mud seem to be spinning webs butterflies of paper delude the eye no models are needed to work from or rather the model in every case is only the precise memory of the object or living fact i asked at a doll maker's for twenty tiny paper dolls each with a different coiffure the whole set to represent the principal kyoto styles of dressing women's hair a girl went to work with white paper paint paste thin slips of pine and the dolls were finished in about the same time that an artist would have taken to draw a similar number of such figures the actual time needed was only enough for the necessary digital movements not for correcting comparing improving the image in the brain realized itself as fast as the slender hands could work thus most of the wonders of festival nights are created toys thrown into existence with a twist of the fingers old rags turned into figured draperies with a few motions of the brush pictures made with sand the same power of enchantment puts human grace under contribution children who on other occasions would attract no attention are converted into fairies by a few deft touches of paint and powder and costumes devised for artificial light artistic sense of line and color suffices for any transformation the tones of decoration are never of chance but of knowledge even the lantern illuminations prove this fact certain tints only being used in combination but the whole exhibition is as evanescent as it is wonderful it vanishes much too quickly to be found fault with it is a mirage that leaves you marvelling and dreaming for a month after having seen it perhaps one inexhaustible source of the contentment the simple happiness belonging to japanese common life is to be found in this universal cheapness of pleasure the delight of the eyes is for everybody not the seasons only nor the festivals furnish enjoyment almost any quaint street any truly japanese interior can give real pleasure to the poorest servant who works without wages the beautiful or the suggestion of the beautiful is free as air besides no man or woman can be too poor to own something pretty no child need be without delightful toys conditions in the occident are otherwise in our great cities beauty is for the rich bare walls and foul pavements and smoky skies for our poor and the tumult of hideous machinery a hell of eternal ugliness and joylessness invented by our civilization to punish the atrocious crime of being unfortunate or weak or stupid or overconfident in the morality of one's fellow man six when i went out next morning to view the great procession the streets were packed so full of people that it seemed impossible for anybody to go anywhere nevertheless all were moving or rather circulating there was a universal gliding and slipping as of fish in a shoal i find no difficulty in getting through the apparently solid press of heads and shoulders to the house of a friendly merchant about half a mile away how any crowd could be packed so closely and yet move so freely is a riddle to which japanese character alone can furnish the key i was not once rudely jostled but japanese crowds are not all alike there are some through which an attempt to pass would be attended with unpleasant consequences of course the yielding fluidity of any concourse is in proportion to its gentleness but the amount of that gentleness in japan varies greatly according to locality in the central and eastern provinces 
the kindliness of a crowd seems to be proportionate to its inexperience of the new civilization this vast gathering of probably not less than a million persons was astonishingly good-natured and good-humoured because the majority of those composing it were simple country folk when the police finally made a lane for the procession the multitude at once arranged itself in the least egotistical manner possible little children to the front adults to the rear though announced for nine o'clock the procession did not appear till nearly eleven and the long waiting in those densely packed streets must have been a strain even upon buddhist patience i was kindly given a kneeling cushion in the front room of the merchant's house but although the cushion was of the softest and the courtesy shown me of the sweetest i became weary of the immobile posture at last and went out into the crowd where i could vary the experience of waiting by standing first on one foot and then on the other before thus deserting my post however i had the privilege of seeing some very charming kyoto ladies including a princess among the merchant's guests kyoto is famous for the beauty of its women and the most charming japanese woman i ever saw was in that house not the princess but the shy young bride of the merchant's eldest son that the proverb about beauty being only skin deep is but a skin deep saying herbert spencer has amply proved by the laws of physiology and the same laws show that grace has a much more profound significance than beauty the charm of the bride was just that rare form of grace which represents the economy of force in the whole framework of the physical structure the grace that startles when first seen and appears more and more wonderful every time it is again looked at it is very seldom indeed that one sees in japan a pretty woman who would look equally pretty in another than her own beautiful national attire what we usually call grace in japanese women is daintiness of form and manner rather than what a greek would have termed grace in this instance one felt assured that long light slender fine faultlessly knit figure would ennoble any costume there was just that suggestion of pliant elegance which the sight of a young bamboo gives when the wind is blowing to describe the procession in detail would needlessly tire the reader and i shall venture only a few general remarks the purpose of the pageant was to represent the various official and military styles of dress worn during the great periods of the history of kyoto from the time of its foundation in the eighth century to the present era of meiji and also the chief military personages of that history at least two thousand persons marched in the procession figuring daimyo kuge hatamoto samurai retainers carriers musicians and dancers the dancers were impersonated by geisha and some were attired so as to look like butterflies with big gaudy wings all the armor and the weapons the ancient headdresses and robes were veritable relics of the past lent for the occasion by old families by professional curio dealers and by private collectors the great captains oda nobunaga kato kiyomasa ieyasu hideyoshi were represented according to tradition a really monkey-faced man having been found to play the part of the famous taiko while these visions of dead centuries were passing by the people kept perfectly silence which fact strange as the statement may seem to western readers indicated extreme pleasure it is not really in accordance with national sentiment to express applause by noisy demonstration by shouting and clapping of hands for example even the military cheer is an importation and the tendency to boisterous demonstrativeness in tokyo is probably as factitious as it is modern i remember two impressive silences in kobe during eighteen ninety five the first was on the occasion of an imperial visit there was a vast crowd the foremost ranks knelt down as the emperor passed 
but there was not even a whisper. The second remarkable silence was on the return of the victorious troops from China, who marched under the triumphal arches erected to welcome them without hearing a syllable from the people. I asked why, and was answered, we Japanese think we can better express our feelings by silence. I may here observe also that the sinister silence of the Japanese armies before some of the late engagements terrified the clamorous Chinese much more than the first opening of the batteries. Despite exceptions, it may be stated as a general truth that the deeper the emotion, whether of pleasure or of pain, and the more solemn or heroic the occasion, in Japan the more naturally silent those who feel or act. Some foreign spectators criticized the display as spiritless, and commented on the unheroic port of the great captains and the undisguised fatigue of their followers, oppressed under a scorching sun by the unaccustomed weight of armor. But to the Japanese all this only made the pageant seem more real, and I fully agreed with them. As a matter of fact, the greatest heroes of military history have appeared at their best in exceptional moments only. The stoutest veterans have known fatigue, and undoubtedly Nobunaga and Hideyoshi and Kato Kiyomasa must have more than once looked just as dusty and ridden or marched just as wearily as their representatives in the Kyoto procession. No merely theatrical idealism clouds, for any educated Japanese, the sense of the humanity of his country's greatest men. On the contrary, it is the historical evidence of that ordinary humanity that most endears them to the common heart, and makes by contrast more admirable and exemplary all of the inner life which was not ordinary. After the procession I went to the Dai Kyokuden, the magnificent memorial Shinto temple built by the government, and described in a former book. On displaying my medal I was allowed to pay reverence to the spirit of good Kwamu Tenno, and to drink a little rice wine in his honour, out of a new wine cup of pure white clay presented by a lovely child Miko. After the libation, the little priestess packed the white cup into a neat wooden box and made me take it home for a souvenir, one new cup being presented to every purchaser of a medal. Such small gifts and memories make up much of the unique pleasure of Japanese travel. In almost any town or village you can buy for a souvenir some pretty or curious thing made only in that one place, and not to be found elsewhere. Again, in many parts of the interior, a trifling generosity is certain to be acknowledged by a present, which, however cheap, will seldom fail to prove a surprise and a pleasure. Of all the things which I picked up here and there in travelling about the country, the prettiest and the most beloved are queer little presents thus obtained. 7. I wanted, before leaving Kyoto, to visit the tomb of Yuko Hatakeyama. After having vainly inquired of several persons where she was buried, it occurred to me to ask a Buddhist priest who had come to the hotel on some parochial business. He answered at once, in the cemetery of Makeji. Makeji was a temple not mentioned in guidebooks and situated somewhere at the outskirts of the city. I took a kuruma forthwith and found myself at the temple gate after about half an hour's run. A priest, to whom I announced the purpose of my visit, conducted me to the cemetery, a very large one, and pointed out the grave. The sun of a cloudless autumn day flooded everything with light, and tinged with spectral gold the face of a monument on which I saw, in beautiful large characters, very deeply cut, the girl's name, with the Buddhist prefix Retsujo, signifying chaste and true. Retsujo Hatakeyama Yuko Haka. The grave was well kept, and the grass had been recently trimmed. 
a little wooden awning erected in front of the stone sheltered the offerings of flowers and sprays of shikimi and a cup of fresh water i did sincere reverence to the heroic and unselfish spirit and pronounced the customary formula some other visitors i noticed saluted the spirit after the shinto manner the tombstones were so thickly crowded about the spot that in order to see the back of the monument i found i should have to commit the rudeness of stepping on the grave but i felt sure she would forgive me so treading reverently i passed round and copied the inscription yuko of nagasagori kamagawa machi from day of birth always good meiji the twenty-fourth year the fifth month the twentieth day cause of sorrow the country having the kyoto government house to went and her own throat cut twenty and seven years tani tetsuomi made kyoto folk by erected this stone is the buddhist kaimyo read gi yu in ton shi chu myo kyo apparently signifying right meaning and valiant woman instantly attaining to the admirable doctrine of loyalty in the temple the priest showed me the relics and mementos of the tragedy a small japanese razor blood crusted with the once white soft paper thickly wrapped round its handle caked into one hard red mass the cheap purse the girdle and clothing blood stiffened all except the kimono washed by order of the police before having been given to the temple letters and memoranda photographs which i secured of yuko and her tomb also a photograph of the gathering in the cemetery where the funeral rites were performed by shinto priests this fact interested me for although condoned by buddhism the suicide could not have been regarded in the same light by the two faiths the clothing was coarse and cheap the girl had pawned her best effects to cover the expenses of her journey and her burial i bought a little book containing the story of her life and death copies of her last letters poems written about her by various persons some of very high rank and a clumsy portrait in the photographs of yuko and her relatives there was nothing remarkable such types you can meet with every day and anywhere in japan the interest of the book was psychological only as regarded both the author and the subject the printed letters of yuko revealed that strange state of japanese exaltation in which the mind remains capable of giving all possible attention to the most trivial matters of fact while the terrible purpose never slackens the memoranda gave like witness meiji twenty-fourth year fifth month eighth day five sen to kurumaya from nihonbashi to ueno nineteenth day five sen to kurumaya to asakusa umamachi one sen five rin for sharpening something to hairdresser in chitaya ten yen received from sano the pawnbroker in baba twenty sen for train to shincho one yen two sen for train from hama to shizuoka twentieth day two yen nine sen for train from shizuoka to hama six sen for postage stamps for two letters fourteen sen in kiyomitsu twelve sen five rin for umbrella given to kurumaya but in strange contrast to the methodical faculty thus manifested was the poetry of a farewell letter containing such thoughts as these the eighty-eighth night that is from the festival of the setsubun having passed like a dream ice changed itself into clear drops and snow gave place to rain then cherry blossoms came to please everybody but now poor things they begin to fall even before the wind touches them again a little while and the wind will make them fly through the bright air in the pure spring weather yet it may be that the hearts of those who love me will not be bright will feel no pleasant spring the season of rains will come next 
and there will be no joy in their hearts. Oh, what shall I do? There has been no moment in which I have not thought of you. But all ice, all snow, becomes at last free water. The incense buds of the kiku will open even in frost. I pray you think later about these things. Even now, for me, is the time of frost, the time of kiku buds. If only they can blossom, perhaps I shall please you much. Placed in this world of sorrow, but not to stay, is the destiny of all. I beseech you, think me not unfilial. Say to none that you have lost me, that I have passed into the darkness. Rather wait and hope for the fortunate time that shall come. The editor of the pamphlet betrayed rather too much of the oriental manner of judging woman, even while showering generous praise upon one typical woman. In a letter to the authorities, Yuko had spoken of a family claim, and this was criticized as a feminine weakness. She had indeed achieved the extinction of personal selfishness, but she had been very foolish to speak about her family. In some other ways the book was disappointing. Under the raw, strong light of its commonplace revelations, my little sketch, Yuko, written in 1894, seemed for the moment much too romantic. And yet the real poetry of the event remained unlessened, the pure ideal that impelled a girl to take her own life merely to give proof of the love and loyalty of a nation. No small, mean, dry facts could ever belittle that large fact. The sacrifice had stirred the feelings of the nation much more than it had touched my own. Thousands of photographs of Yuko and thousands of copies of the little book about her were sold. Multitudes visited her tomb and made offerings there, and gazed with tender reverence at the relics in Makeji, and all this I thought for the best of reasons. If commonplace facts are repellent to what we are pleased, in the West, to call refined feelings, it is proof that the refinement is factitious and the feeling shallow. To the Japanese, who recognize that the truth of beauty belongs to the inner being, commonplace details are precious. They help to accentuate and verify the conception of a heroism. Those poor blood-stained trifles, the coarse honest robes and girdle, the little cheap purse, the memoranda of a visit to the pawnbroker, the glimpses of plain, humble, everyday humanity shown by the letters and the photographs, and the infinitesimal precision of police records, all serve, like so much ocular evidence, to perfect the generous comprehension of the feeling that made the fact. Had Yuko been the most beautiful person in Japan, and her people of the highest rank, the meaning of her sacrifice would have been far less intimately felt. In actual life, as a general rule, it is the common, not the uncommon person, who does noble things, and the people, seeing best, by the aid of ordinary facts, what is heroic in one of their own class, feel themselves honoured. Many of us in the West will have to learn our ethics over again from the common people. Our cultivated classes have lived so long in an atmosphere of false idealism, mere conventional humbug, that the real, warm, honest human emotions seem to them vulgar, and the natural and inevitable punishment is an ability to see, to hear, to feel, and to think. There is more truth in the little verse poor Yuko wrote on the back of her mirror than in most of our conventional idealism. By one keeping the heart free from stain, virtue and right and wrong are seen clearly as forms in a mirror. 8. I returned by another way, through a quarter which I had never seen before, all temples a district of great spaces, vast and beautiful and hushed as by enchantment. No dwellings or shops. Pale yellow walls only, sloping back from the roadway on both sides, like fortress walls, 
but coped with a coping or rooflet of blue tiles and above these yellow sloping walls pierced with elfish gates at long long intervals great soft hilly masses of foliage cedar and pine and bamboo with superbly curved roofs sweeping up through them each vista of those silent streets of temples bathed in the gold of the autumn afternoon gave me such a thrill of pleasure as one feels on finding in some poem the perfect utterance of a thought one has tried for years in vain to express yet what was the charm made with the wonderful walls were but painted mud the gates and the temples only frames of wood supporting tiles the shrubbery the stonework the lotus ponds mere landscape gardening nothing solid nothing enduring but a combination so beautiful of lines and colours and shadows that no speech could paint it nay even were those earthen walls turned into lemon-coloured marble and their tiling into amethyst even were the material of the temples transformed into substance precious as that of the palace described in the sutra of the great king of glory still the aesthetic suggestion the dreamy repose the mellow loveliness and softness of the scene could not be in the least enhanced perhaps it is just because the material of such creation is so frail that its art is so marvellous the most wonderful architecture the most entrancing landscapes are formed with substance the most imponderable the substance of clouds but those who think of beauty only in connection with costliness with stability with firm reality should never look for it in this land well called the land of sunrise for sunrise is the hour of illusions nothing is more lovely than a japanese village among the hills or by the coast when seen just after sunrise through the slowly lifting blue mists of a spring or autumn morning but for the matter-of-fact observer the enchantment passes with the vapours in the raw clear light he can find no palaces of amethyst no sails of gold but only flimsy sheds of wood and thatch and the unpainted queerness of wooden junks so perhaps it is with all that makes life beautiful in any land to view men or nature with delight we must see them through illusions subjective or objective how they appear to us depends upon the ethical conditions within us nevertheless the real and the unreal are equally elusive in themselves the vulgar and the rare the seemingly transient and the seemingly enduring are all alike mere ghostliness happiest he who from birth to death sees ever through some beautiful haze of the soul best of all that haze of love which like the radiance of the orient day turns common things to gold end of section 4